Welcome to the first episode of Additive, a MarkForge podcast about everything to do with additive manufacturing. We'll be covering a wide range of topics from 3D printed robots and drones to bioengineering components. I'm Marco Modetsky. Today, we're joined by MarkForge content engineer Nick Martin and Dexter inventor Kent Gilson from Haddington Dynamics. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Mark. Good to meet you. All right. To start things off, I think we should talk about the robot in the room. Dexter, can you tell us a little bit about Dexter? Certainly. So Dexter is a uh, ultra high precision, low cost, 3D printed motion and force platform. It's a seven axis serial linked uh, robot arm that uh, we designed to be specifically 3D printed. And we're using 3D printing to leverage uh, being able to rapidly iterate and kind of create a clean sheet of paper design for the Dexter. Now, Dexter's performance numbers, we're measuring better than 30 microns of repeatability. And it's got about a 700 millimeter radial reach. It's actually better than a meter envelope. And it can carry three kilograms while it only weighs just over five kilograms. So we can actually turn it upside down and turn it into a leg. Great. So Dexter is a little bit different than some of these huge industrial robots that might be used on a factory floor. But what makes it different? That's a good question, actually. My background is uh, FPGA-based supercomputing. And so we have kind of a unique tool set to solve some of the traditional mechanical error problems and complexity problems of robotics. And so what we've done is we've actually been able to come up with a computational solution to measuring out the mechanical errors using the FPGA We've been able to create a system where we're able to directly measure the deflection of each angle of each joint to within an arc second resolution. And uh, by doing that, we're able to get a direct measurement of the angle. So it doesn't matter what the mechanical linkages are and what the precision of the transmissions are because we're able to measure all of that in a traditional robot. You normally have your actuator, and that's connected to a series elastic component, and then to the joint, and you're measuring at the transmission or at the motor. And so all of the air from the transmission through the series elastic element into the actual actuated joint are not being measured. So we're actually putting the measured system on the other end of that and measuring directly the deflection of the joints. Now, that requires a lot of computation to do that, because if we're getting better than a million points per revolution and we're doing that revolution in one second, then you've got a, Shannon information theory says that you got to sample it 2 million times a second. And so we've got to be able to close that servo loop and do all of the metrology, which includes trigonometry and linear algebra and those things within those sub-microsecond times. So that's why we need the FPGA. This is a code disk that we've got a little bit farther. And you can actually see the little slits there. And those are actually printed on the printer also. And that's the other innovation is that the metrology system, high resolution coders normally rely on very precise geometry of the uh, code disk in order to reference the accuracy of the system. And with 3D printers, of course, every one of those uh, slits is uh, unique. We call it harmonically rich as opposed to noisy. (laughs) But the thing is, it's all repeatable. So each one of those slits are actually uniquely identifiable with the signal processing algorithms. So we're able to kind of use our knowledge of signal processing and the uniqueness of the code disk to be able to create an analog interpolating encoder that also gives us absolute position information. And that's the trick. And for some of our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the term, what does FPGA stand for? That stands for Filled Programmable Gate Array. Basically, it's a chip that you can put information into and physically rewire it. So it's like having a custom ASIC that you don't have to actually build. You can actually just change the information and it will run in parallel and run like it's a full custom chip. And you have one of those in the robot itself. That's very impressive. So you've built a very cool piece of technology there. And this is something that you've brought to market very much independently, right? You had a Kickstarter campaign? Yeah, we did. We've been self-funded so far. And we had a Kickstarter campaign about two years ago where we open sourced the robot and sold kits. It was before we had our manufacturing figured out. Well, it was before we actually had the Mark Forge printers. And so we knew we didn't have the manufacturing figured out. And so we offered them as kits and we got good uptake on that and it launched us. So tell us a little bit more about that and how 3D printing has helped you launch a technology like this in a short amount of time independently? Yeah, that's actually the salient question. We knew that we had a control system theory that we wanted to test out and be able to design a robot around it. But we also knew that if it worked, then we would have an opportunity to completely redesign the architecture of the robot where all of the motors are put in the base and we're able to optimize the power to rate ratio, which is one of the primary engineering envelope elements that you try to conserve. 
and in order to do that, we knew that we had about 30 years worth of evolution, mechanical evolution time that we needed to speed up. And so we selected this additive manufacturing technology so that we could do hundreds, literally thousands of design iterations in a very short period of time. So that was the real motivation behind using 3D printers. Well, that and also with additive manufacturing, complexity is free if you're going to stay in additive manufacturing. In other words, if you're going to continue to build your parts with 3D printers, then your design options are just vastly improved. So we wanted to you'll leverage kind of the power to weight ratio or the strength to weight ratio of nearly hollow infill and be able to control the, the wall thicknesses and where all those walls were being put in order to optimize our geometry so that we get kind of the lowest mass, highest strength components. So it's really both of those, the ability to leverage free complexity and be able to iterate very quickly on the design to be able to get many episodes, many uh, generations on the robot. And that's actually really worked out. In fact, I don't think we've built a single robot where we haven't changed something on it. But it's also helped us to kind of pioneer this idea of continuous integration in hardware. And it also has, we call this robot a reconfigurable robot because we're using the 3D printers and our philosophy of everything is 3D printed to do custom end effectors like grippers that have very specialized fingers. And we can come up with a design and print it out and actually test it within a 24-hour period. And that includes print time. You have an entirely new gripper for doing something. So In automation, a lot of the time and cost and energy is in fixturing your processes in order to get a robot to work with it. And with additive manufacturing, you just have this unlimited permutation capability to create custom tooling on top of your custom robot to very quickly create new automation solutions. What I find interesting about what you're doing with 3D printing in your application here is that you have been 3D printing parts in order to essentially iterate upon the design, but then you've stuck with it through to production. So you're 3D printing a lot of the parts on that final production robot that's getting shipped out to customers. Is that right? Absolutely. No, we're 3D printing everything and we'll continue through volume, through millions of unit pieces of volume. The economics, they're somewhat counterintuitive, but some of the same economics that operate in using FPGAs for computers. And that's kind of my background is, you know, fill programmable gate array custom computing machines. And FPGAs are supposedly compared to an ASIC slower and they cost more and they use more energy. But the ability to rapidly change and to optimize and specialize the circuitry that goes in them gives them enormous economic advantages. And the same types of things happen in uh, additive manufacturing where it's really not the ability to kind of do what everyone else does or make your printers build aluminum molds or something like that or aluminum parts that are as good as the other materials. It's the ability to go beyond that and get super specialized capabilities, either geometries or materials to get even better performance or weight to strength performance than you can with traditional materials. Yeah, and I think you bring up an interesting point about how 3D printing allows you to really iterate on the hardware very quickly, and that way you can come up with many different designs and test them. You mentioned you have a background in software. I don't know how much you worked with hardware in that time, but as a mechanical engineer, I know I was always frustrated waiting for parts to be made. You know, you could be waiting weeks, whereas in 3D printing, it allows you to shorten that hardware development time. And you with a background of software, I'm sure you're used to having maybe two-week sprints where you can push software very quickly. And you're hitting on the point where hardware, we're trying to get it to catch up to that software cycle where you can be iterating on a weekly basis or daily basis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep, hardware is software. With that of manufacturing, that's exactly the metaphor that is appropriate. Cool. Let's take a step back and talk more about the use cases of Dexter and where you see this robot being used. Absolutely. So we actually consider ourselves in the additive manufacturing business. The reason for doing Dexter, the reason that we wanted a robot and a high precision robot is that we wanted a machine that could ultimately self-replicate. A lot of the inspiration came from the RepRap project, this idea that early 3D printers could print their own parts. We were like, wait a minute, we don't need to just print them. We need to assemble them and we need to do things in multiple axes. And so a serial linked robot arm, a seven axis serial linked robot arm represents the necessary and sufficient capability to really do anything in a three-dimensional space. And that includes 3D printing, it includes fiber layup, includes subtractive processes also, it includes wiring, using magnet wire and creating coils for making motors. It includes grabbing the inkjet cartridge heads and doing 3D printing of thin film transistors. And really the whole idea of doing direct digital manufacturing of heterogeneous systems that have heterogeneous processes in them, all from one machine. And so that's the ultimate goal. 
So we're at the point where we've got a highly precise 3D produced. Actually, the idea of robots building robots is the ultimate goal because then we'll have an unlimited means of production. When robots can build more of themselves, then it also represents a complex enough build that they can really build pretty much anything else too. And so with that, it changes economics, it changes all kinds of things that have social implications. I think the interesting thing about that is it kind of naturally brings to mind the idea of attaching a print head onto the robot itself with the level of precision that you're able to achieve with the arm. You'd essentially be able to make a 3D printer out of the robot. Yeah, that's been part of our ambition. We've kind of put that off to the community. There's been a couple of people that bought the robot that want to put a hot end on it and do 3D printing, but it's still pretty early for that. Gantry systems are still faster and able to get better than 30 micron movement repeatability. So it's uh, maybe large format printing, external envelope or multiple robots working on the same project. That might be an early entry for that. But really, robot architectures are everything. I mean, a Mark Forge printer is a robot. It's an additive manufacturing robot. And so in our estimation, robots are already building robots. And that's what we love about the Mark Forge is that, that it really interfaces precisely with our objectives. And in fact, as we learn more and more about doing robot construction with robots, then the architecture of the robot will probably change. When we find processes that are outside of the force envelope of the robot, then we either have to modify the robot to get more force or we have to modify the design of that uh, particular process so that it takes less force. So we see this continuous evolution of machine architectures as it evolves. So how long have you been working on this? That's a good question. How do you measure it? I've been working on this particular project for about five years, but the technology to actually control it, the FPGA technology, the supercomputer I built, I actually built with the intention of being a machine controller (laughs) so that we could do this kind of high precision, many, many axes, synchronized control. It just turned out that there became a market for high performance, low cost FPGA based computers. And so we kind of pursued that for about 10 years. So in the time that you've been actually building these robotic arms, from what I understand, you've actually been 3D printing them before or you had a Mark Forage machine, you had another printer? Oh yeah, so now this is where the story gets good. We were using early hobby printers to do some of the early design and we'd hoped to go into production with those, but there was a lot of issues with those low-end printers that made it impossible. We couldn't get the same, print the same part twice on the same machine and come out with unusable tolerances, unusable variations. So it wasn't until we got the Mark Forge printers that we even could build a business around it. So they're higher end printers, but they're order of magnitude more expensive than the Mark Forge. And the Mark Forges, when we got them and tested them, we were amazed at the precision. In fact, the story behind that is, is we were at Bay Area Maker Fair and an old colleague of mine walked up from NASA and said, hey, that's a cool robot. So he actually had brought parts from his printers. He has some Mark Forges there at his lab in Langley and uh, showed us the parts. And we were like, wow, those are beautiful. That's uh, really quality parts. And so we downloaded the Iger software and did some tests with it. As you know, there's a cost estimate for the parts. And we realized, well, these really aren't that more expensive. And he brought some of the continuous carbon fiber reinforced parts. And I was just amazed by the strength and the weight, the mass of it. And so we bought a Mark II and started building parts. And it was just a revelation. It was a whole new tool. I sat down and said, wow, it's finally here. Additive manufacturing has finally crossed that threshold where it's no longer a prototype environment, but now you can actually build things that you can't build any other way. And that's really the magic of the Mark II is that you can do things in that that you can't build in any other process. And so it's not really even like we have an option to go to any other kind of process to get the same kind of strength to weight ratio and the things that are important to building a robot. So couple the uh, ability to actually do things that you can't do any other way and the reliability of the printers. And me and my partners got together and said, hey, we've got a business. We can do this. So I took a couple of weeks off at Christmas and redesigned the entire robot to use the uh, capabilities of the Mark Forge printers and had one up and running uh, within about four weeks. So a complete redesign of a project that we'd been working three years on in about a month from printer to robot. That's awesome. One thing I wanted to bring up is, from my understanding, you use a lot of different hardware in the robot that's not necessarily 3D printed. Most of the parts, as you say, are printed, but then you include some linkages and other parts that aren't printed. I want you to talk a little bit about maybe some design decisions that went into that and why 3D printing everything isn't always the best tool, but it's just a tool that's used within the robot. 
Actually, there's nothing really in there that we use that is not 3D printed. I mean, we have some carbon fiber tubes that we have, but we've also printed those carbon fiber tubes on the Mark Forge, and they're very rigid, and it's really just those two tubes. Everything else is just nuts and bolts and wires, and actually, Todd just showed me, this is an example of one of the links, the carbon fiber tubes that I, this is 3D printed that replaces. Oh, great. The, That's yeah. awesome. And there's a lot of yeah, carbon fiber in there. So in terms of those tubes, are you printing them typically for the production robots or are you buying off-the-shelf carbon fiber tubes for those linkages? Actually, we bought a bunch of carbon fiber tubes and uh, we're just going through our inventory. Once those are gone, we'll be printing those too. So Interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting design decision because you have the option to print parts that are just as strong as maybe some off-the-shelf composite or metal parts, but sometimes it's better to include off-the-shelf parts with the printed parts. Sometimes it's better to print them and I just love hearing how people think about that. Yeah, well, maybe we're an anomaly because we try to design to, to take advantage of the materials and the process uh, advantages that we have with the 3D printers, with the Mark Forge printers. So our design decisions are more about how do we get more of this printed versus how do we leverage other things? Yeah, and it's interesting coming from your perspective. You're like, oh, well, obviously we use nuts and bolts and that hardware. But a lot of people who aren't as familiar with 3D printing, they think of printing that hardware. You have the ability to print threads and print hardware. So some people think that's the next logical step. When a lot of times those are very inexpensive off-the-shelf hardware pieces that you can just integrate with your design. Yeah, I mean, we built some of the early robots where there were no bolts or nuts or anything. And we just used composite fabricating techniques, epoxy and uh, pressure and heat to bond everything together. And this was actually in the early development stage. So whenever something went wrong, we'd actually have to break out the Dremel and cut it apart and rebuild it in order to make that happen. So a lot of the decision-making about using nuts and bolts was really about infield serviceability and being able to uh, fix something in the build and not have to remake the entire robot. Yeah, I'm sure it makes it a lot more modular as well with that, being able to swap out end effectors and the like. Yep, Absolutely. So when you talk about additive manufacturing as a whole, at this point in the market, you have a wide range of materials available, both from some of our printers and other printers on the market. But you've gone with carbon fiber and you're using continuous fiber in a lot of these parts, right? Oh, yeah. The continuous carbon fiber is a breakthrough. And you don't have to use a lot of it. You can use single wall continuous carbon fiber and you get amazing properties out of it. So we have a couple of different techniques that we leverage. We like the idea of using the isotropic layers and uh, separating them by about two or three millimeters. And so you actually get a torque box where you get a plane on one and then a plane on the top and you get most of the uh, strength of a solid piece of carbon fiber at very low cost. And then we also use the uh, concentric fiber layup in alternating patterns inside and outside to actually create things like arches and trusses with the carbon fiber and just single element reinforcements or single thread reinforcements. And it really increases the compression strength of particularly the pulleys for the, but it also you get the uh, torque box effect too with just the concentric carbon fiber placed on different layers. Yeah, I want to also maybe take a moment to dive a little deeper into some of those parts that you may be reinforcing with carbon fiber. For me, the two of the most exciting things about your guys' robot are your encoders, which you've already mentioned briefly. And then also you guys are 3D printing cyclotal drives, which I had never heard of before. And so maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Yeah. So here's a version of a cycloidal drive that we built. It's a two-stage. That's the top output stage. And there's another uh, cam underneath that. But this is actually built as a single unit. So we use the features of the posit layer to be able to uh, go in and insert bearings and shafts and things like that into the print. In fact, we even have a stage where we print the cams out, which are heavy carbon fiber laden. And then halfway through the print, we actually scrape those off the bed and then place them inside of the other part that's being built because there's some issues with the support materials and keeping that clear as you combine these uh, multiple parts together. But this was actually printed in a single piece and uh, we pulled it off the print bed and plugged it in the motor and it, and it runs. Now, that's cool. But the bigger issue is, is that cyclotal drives are very complex pieces of equipment. And they're actually superior to harmonic drives for robot actuation because you don't have the springiness as you change directions in a harmonic drive. Even though there's no backlash, as you pass through that spring hysteresis, you get a zero force regime. And that's just as difficult to control from a control system as having backlash. So you have a net harmonic, natural mechanical harmonic resonance of just a few hertz. And you really can't control the robot precisely very quickly because of that. But with the cycloidal drive, Everything is rigid, and with the carbon fiber in there, it's uh, really, really rigid. And so we can have a much faster control frequency. 
So the engineering properties are what's kind of uh, driven us to go to the cycloidal, but there's economic advantages. There's not much of a supply of, of uh, harmonic drives right now with all the robots that are running harmonic drives. And so it's kind of the harmonic drive supply chain hell. And these cost less. Even though we have dozens of bearings in here, the cycloidal drive is about half the cost of the cheapest Chinese harmonic drive that we could find. Mm-hmm. The only ones I've ever used or seen are literally thousands of dollars at the cheapest. And so it was fascinating to me that not only that you were able to manufacture them so easily on your printer, but for even a lower price, which is really cool. Yeah, actually, the uh, cycloidal drives that are normally out there, they've got an architecture called a pin drive where they don't actually have bearings and stuff inside around the cams and the output pins. And so they have to be very, very precise. You have to use tool and die types of tolerances in order to get them to work. And over temperature, if things change, then they can lock up. So we have a little bit different architecture. We actually have bearing surfaces on everything. Even though everything's supposed to be a tangential, you know, rolling friction type of interface, we actually put bearings on there and then uh, pre-stress them, actually change the size of the cams just enough to be able to pre-stress those bearings so that we get a very rigid and loaded transmission that still moves smoothly across the temperature changes. Yeah, and that's awesome. You're able to leverage the advantages of 3D printing in that case where maybe it's not as precise of a manufacturing process as you can achieve with other machines, but you can leverage the strength to pre-stress that and actually get that rigidity that you need in your transmission. That's 3D printed, which is amazing. Yep, and then that actually shows up in the calibration tables that we build. So the same signal processing control system we use for measuring and correcting out the harmonic richness of the 3D printed code disks is the same algorithm that's needed to smooth out or normalize any kind of inconsistencies in the 3D printed cycloidal drives. Awesome. And so the other part that you mentioned earlier is your optical encoders. Now, you mentioned that you guys are reading analog signals from them. And typically, maybe for our listeners who haven't worked in robotics or aren't as familiar with robotics, typically from encoders, you're reading a digital signal. So maybe you could explain further how you guys are unique in that aspect. Yeah, so that's that's true. Most encoders are what they call quadrature encoders. And what we're doing is we actually uh, have a two phototransistor and diode pairs that are offset by 90 degrees. And so we're essentially getting a sign and a cosine value out of that. And we actually adjust the LEDs so that they are generating just enough light to get a nice round top as it uh, goes from light to dark. So we get a nice fairly circular pattern out of it. And then we're able to take that and put the cosine on the x-axis and the sine on the y-axis and take the arctangent too, which is the normal to the tangent, which is the angle that those two uh, sine and cosines actually make. And that gives us kind of a linear interpolation between the light and the dark of the code disks. And we're doing that with the uh, 12-bit analog to digital converters. So we're getting about 8,000 points per slit resolution out of those. That's fascinating stuff. So what are some of these customers building or or doing with your robotic arms? Is there anything you can share? There are some things that I can share, some that I can't, but people often ask us, is there a main application space that's getting traction? And we've normally said no. I mean, we've got just over 100 robots out there and we've got maybe 99 different applications. But in further reducing that, trying to create meta categories out of that, which is what we do because we're trying to find a target market that we can really hammer on, We're seeing that uh, kind of using the robot as a uh, metrology platform where people are putting different types of sensors on the end, cameras and lasers and ultrasound transducers. We've got a couple of different groups working with that and then using it because it has a precise information about where the arm is, where the sensor is. They're able to get kind of process gain out of their sensor systems. But it ranges. NASA is using it in their uh, fit-to-fly program where they're using to... uh, you know, automate this idea of doing FAA certified inspections of drones, you know, every hundred hours. So being able to detect uh, delamination in the composites and then also being able to actually probe the boards electronically, inject signals and connect to it and determine if the, uh, the drone that has gone out of sight is still a trusted system. People are bottling wine with it. One guy from the Kickstarter uh, actually uh, bought it, stir the perfect risotto. You can actually feel (laughs) the viscosity of the fluid and know when to add new gravy in. That's great. Yeah. One of the things that the robot can do is because it's got this force capability, it can actually share it between multiple robots. And so it's a kind of a telekinetics where you can actually feel your remote uh, locations. And so we've got a couple of customers who are using it to localize their workforce in one place and be able to have you know, multiple different sites that are remote, cost a lot of money to you know, send humans there and just send the robot there. And the robot can be delivered by a drone or whatever. And uh, then the humans can actually connect to it and interact with it and fill their environment and actually do work in either harsh environments or just far away environments. 
It's amazing. And all of this allowed by the fact that you guys have extremely high precision on the end effector of your arm because of everything you've already mentioned. And having worked with some of the industrial arms out there before, you know, like KUKA and stuff like that, it's interesting to see that these are massive industrial arms that are made out of these giant steel parts. And it's this huge, heavy arm with all these safety restrictions because of how massive it is. And you guys have this very low profile arm. The payload isn't huge. You said three kilograms on the newest one, correct? Yeah. And so I was wondering, you speak about how 3D printing allows you to really get this small form factor with this still very powerful arm. How do you see 3D printing impacting the robotics industry as a whole, whether it's in industrial robotics with arms or in other facets of the industry? Well, that's a good question. It's hard to uh, fathom those traditional industries not being completely disrupted. I mean, they're using old technology. Robotics is actually very ancient in the context of modern technology. I mean, still using PLC controllers and lateral logic and RS-422. I mean, these are 30 plus year old technologies. Brute force almost. (laughs) Yeah. And metal. Metal is the exact wrong thing to use for a robot. I mean, it changes its shape with temperature changes. Exactly. Uh, And that's another benefit of having the carbon fiber. Carbon fiber actually has a negative thermal expansion coefficient. And so you can actually get very, the R robot will run, keep its same precision and accuracy over a huge temperature differential. But 3D printing and additive manufacturing is going to change everything. I mean, everyone's talking about it. And it's just going to take the few thought leaders out there to actually go out and demonstrate what it does and how it does it to make that happen. You'd be surprised, actually, we were shocked at how often people come up to us at trade shows, even automation trade shows, and, and uh, look at the arm and say, that's cool. What does it do? <laughs> and we're like, Every, I mean, it's, uh, it's what, what doesn't it do? Right. So, yeah, all of manufacturing is being disrupted by automation and 3D printing. So if you get 3D printed automation, you get a double whammy of that. And so really the uh, evolution rate that you can uh, you know, achieve with uh, using additive manufacturing and then the quality and uh, superior performance of uh, Mark Ford's continuous carbon fiber and their metal printers changes yet another whole dimension of that engineering performance envelope and also the economic model of how you yield product that goes into the mass market. One of the economic factors that we haven't talked about is that the entry-level Mark Forge printer is uh, only $3,500, and we sell these robots for about ten grand. So with the cost of a... I mean, we, we calculate our price of printers at about five grand because we've got about 20% of our parts are actually using the continuous carbon fiber. So we need the Mark II, and that's a little bit more expensive printer. So we figure we've got a unit cost of our capability at about five grand for a printer, but that's still half the cost of a robot. So we can amortize our capital equipment expense over the sale of a single robot. So we can scale at a kind of an N plus one or N plus 0.5 in our delivery of our products. So you don't have to buy million dollar pieces of equipment to actually set up an entire robot factory. So that's going to change the economics of it. So we're taking a CapEx and putting it into an OpEx or operational expense. That's amazing. So I think with that, we're going to wrap things up. Nick, did you have any other? No, oh, thank you, Kent, for everything. You've been extremely <laughs> informative. It's amazing to hear about this technology. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the platform. We're, we're trying to tell people about the robot. And now it's really the robot and Mark Forge printers because we can't do one without the other. Ken and Nick, thank you for being here. If you want to learn more about Haddington Dynamics' robot, you can visit them at hdrobotic.com where you can find out more information. And if you want to learn more about the printers that we discussed today that allow them to print continuous composite carbon fiber along with a nylon base, you can visit us at markforge.com. Tune in to the Additive Podcast next month to learn how 3D printing fits in a metal fabrication shop.